Introduction of History of the Kings of Britain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles Introduction The British history, of which we now offer to the public a revised translation, has been to our early dramatic poets what the ill-fated house of Oedipus was to the tragic writers of ancient Greece. Those who have felt pleasure in the Comus of Milton, Drayton's Polyolbion, and still more in the King Lear of Shakespeare, will not be sorry to see the source, whence these great poets drew their materials, made more accessible to the English reader. It is necessary to state this at the outset. We do not insert the British history in our series of early English records as a work containing an authentic narrative. Nor do we wish to compare Geoffrey of Monmouth with Bede in point of veracity. But the fact of his having supplied our early poets so large a portion of their subjects, and the universal belief which at one time prevailed as to the authenticity of his history, make it, in every respect, a question whether he ought not to be preserved, whilst the ample allusions and, if we may use the expression, the groundwork on which many of the facts are based, enable us indubitably to introduce him into our series as an addition, though secondary in value, to materials which our readers will find not to be inexhaustible, respecting our early history. The work was translated into English by Thompson, and published in eight volumes, in the year 1718. He followed, for the most part, Comelline's edition of the original, Heidelberg Folio, 1587. Prefixed to the work is a long introduction in which the translator endeavours to defend his author from the charge of having inserted the narrative which he professes to have translated from the old British tongue. It is now, of course, universally admitted that the whole series of British kings, from Brutus downwards, is a tissue of fables, but it may readily be conceded that Geoffrey did not view the matter in this light. Nor shall we be disposed in the present day to deny the conclusion at which the translator arrives, that the work contains a large quantity of matter which is fabulous, but that Geoffrey has done no more than fulfil the task which he took upon himself of translating it from the original language. The following are a few of Thompson's arguments, which we give by way of specimen. 1. That upon its first appearance in the world, the book met with a universal approbation, and that too from those who had better opportunities of examining the truth of it, as there were then more monuments extant, and the traditions were more fresh and uncorrupted concerning the ancient British affairs, than any critics of the present age can pretend to. 2. That, except William of Newburgh, about the end of the reign of Richard I, it met with no opponents, even down to the seventeenth century but was, on the contrary, quoted by all, in particular by Edward I, in a controversy before Boniface VIII. 3. That we see in this history the traces of venerable antiquity. 4. That the story of Bruta and the descent of the Britons from the Trojans was universally allowed by Geraldus Cambriensis and others, and was opposed for the first time by John of Westhamstead, who lived in the fifteenth century. That Polydore Virgil's contempt for it proceeded from his wish to preserve unimpaired the glory of the Romans, and Buchanan's observations betray his ignorance of the story. 5. That Leyland, who lived under Henry the Eighth, Humphrey Lloyd, Sir John Price, Dr. Keyes, Dr. Powell, and others, have supported the story of Bruta, etc. 
it will not be necessary to follow them further. Let us then consider the account which Geoffrey himself gives of the work which he offered to his contemporaries. This account, in the words of the former translator, and with his additional remarks upon it, is as follows. The story, as collected from himself, Leyland, Bale, and Pitts, is that Walter Mapes, alias Calanus, Archdeacon of Oxford, who flourished in the reign of Henry I, and of whom Henry of Huntingdon, and other historians as well as Geoffrey himself, make honourable mention, being a man very curious in the study of antiquity, and a diligent searcher into ancient libraries, and especially after the works of ancient authors, happened, while he was in America, to light upon a history of Britain, written in the British tongue, and carrying marks of great antiquity. And being overjoyed at it, as if he had found a vast treasure, he in a short time after came over to England, where inquiring for a proper person to translate this curious but hitherto unknown book, he very opportunely met with Geoffrey of Monmouth, a man profoundly versed in the history and antiquities of Britain, excellently skilled in the British tongue, and withal, considering the time, an elegant writer both in verse and prose, and so recommended this task to him. Accordingly Geoffrey, being incredibly delighted with this ancient book, undertook the translating of it into Latin, which he performed with great diligence, approving himself, according to Matthew Paris, a faithful translator. At first he divided it into four books, written in a plain and simple style, and dedicated it to Robert, Earl of Gloucester, a copy whereof is said to be at Bennet College in Cambridge, which was never yet published. But afterwards he made some alterations, and divided it into eight books, to which he added the book of Merlin's Prophecies, which he had also translated from British verse into Latin prose, prefixing to it a preface, and a letter to Alexander, Bishop of Lincoln. A great many fabulous and trifling stories were inserted into the history. But that was not his fault. His business as a translator was to deliver them faithfully, such as they were, and to leave them to the judgment of the learned to be discussed. To prove the truth of this relation, and to answer at once all objections against Geoffrey's integrity, one needs no other argument than an assurance that the original manuscript which Geoffrey translated, of whose antiquity the curious are able to judge in a great measure by the character, or any ancient and authentic copy of it is yet extant. And indeed, Archbishop Usher mentioned an old Welsh chronicle in the Cotonian Library that formerly was in the possession of that learned antiquary, Humphrey Lloyd, which he says is thought to be that which Geoffrey translated. But if that be the original manuscript, it must be acknowledged that Geoffrey was not merely a translator, but made some additions of his own, since, as that most learned prelate informs us, the account that we have in this history of the British Flamens and Arch Flamens is nowhere to be found in it. But besides this, there are several copies of it in the Welsh tongue, mentioned by the late ingenious and learned Mr. Lloyd in his Archaeologia Britannica. And I myself have met with a manuscript of the history of our British affairs, written above a hundred years ago by Mr. John Lewis, and shortly to be published, wherein the author says that he had the original of the British history in parchment written in the British tongue before Geoffrey's time, as he concludes from this circumstance, that in his book Geoffrey's preface was wanting, and the preface to his book was the second chapter of that published by Geoffrey. My ignorance of the Welsh tongue renders me unqualified for making any search into these matters. And though the search should be attended with never so much satisfaction to those who are able to judge of the antiquity of manuscripts, yet to the generality of readers other arguments would perhaps be more convincing. The above extract informs the English reader of the date at which Geoffrey lived, 
and every other particular necessary to be known respecting the history of the work. In the present edition, the translation of Thompson has been followed, revised, and corrected wherever the phraseology appeared to be unsuited to the more accurate ears of the present day. A short chronology of the history has been added, which may not be thought out of place by the lovers of Shakespeare, Milton, and our early poets. J. A. Giles, Windlesham Hall, November, 1842. End of Introduction